All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Polymathics, the channel that helps you become a modern day renaissance man. And today, oh, it's been so long since I've done one of these, I kind of forgot how to do it. I'm Josh, AKA Josh Miss Prime. You know what it is. And today we're going to actually answer a question that someone sent on, an, on another video and as you all can see, I've kind of changed my setup here a little bit. I still do the driving uh, videos and actually, so that's another thing, like I'll give a channel update later, but I've been making videos throughout this whole time frame. It's probably been a year or two since I've really posted, but um, I've been working on some other big projects in the background, still posting video or still creating videos, just not posting them. But the plan is to really roll out a lot of the material that I've been holding on to. As you can see, I also have a new setup here in my office, which might be moving soon is another reason why I've been holding office because there's a pending move. We're finally going to get a house again. So, okay. So let's get into this question. As you can see right here, I have no idea how to pronounce this, but Tajazwi asked, what atonement with the father situation could lead the hero to become a, a tragic hero? Also, movie examples would be really helpful. And this is actually a really good question. It piggybacks off of a video that Susie and I did a while ago. Um, and actually, let's see if we go back here. It's this video right here. Atonement with the Father, Metamyth, what is Atonement with the Father stages in the hero's journey, and or Monomyth. And we go into a lot of really good detail. This is a good video to watch if you're not familiar with Atonement with the Father. Also, another one that's pretty good is this one right here, Apostasis, because it kind of coincides with Atonement a little bit. Oftentimes, the stage atonement with father and apotheosis are very close together. And one of the steps in apotheosis is apostasis. I don't want to get sidetracked here, but you'll see them often in, if, if it's a movie and, and for example, this is a really good example. The, the, the one that I gave right here, where Luke's hand gets chopped off. That is right after the Atonement with Father stage in Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. And then it goes straight into apostasis and then it goes into apotheosis. So <clears throat> um, you'll often see these things happen back to back to back. And just to give you this example, before we get into the meat of this, right, is you have Vader saying, join me, and we will rule the galaxy as father and son. And Luke is like, Luke is like, no, I can never join you. And then he tells him he's his father. And Luke, even though in his, he, he's saying, no, that's not true. It can't be true. We all know by the great acting that Mark Hamill did that... Luke knows it to be true. And then later on, he says as much. But in that moment, we even can tell his body is trying to reject the truth that he already knows is true. His hand is chopped off. And I think that actually happens a little bit before whatever. I don't know the exact sequence of, sequence of events. He falls down the air shafts. And then he's about to die. He's about to fall down Cloud City and die like a terrible death. And he's able to tap into the force and use the force to connect with Leia. And that is the apotheosis step. So it goes from atonement with the father to apostasis to apotheosis. But remember, apostasis, in my opinion, it's a step that's within apotheosis. In order for apotheosis to happen, one must go through a cutting off and that can this is a physical cutting off but there are figurative ones as well but sometimes it happens it's the step that connects 
the the father figure sorry the atonement with father to the apotheosis stage so why is this all important because what we're going to get into when we're answering the question is a lot of this this stuff right here right now and um uh just as a recap of this video just as a recap of this video right here for those of you who are just joining in don't have 30 minutes to recap on on the video that i'm mentioning the the main thing or one of the main points that we bring up that will help answer this question is that apotheosis i'm sorry is that the atonement with father stage atonement means at one mint with the father or with the parent and i'm not going to go into great detail there are some nuances there but the main point is that the hero in this phase has an opportunity to become one with the father okay and the the question that was asked is a situation that could lead the hero to become a tragic hero and that's the key difference here that we're talking about when when I when we're going to answer this because there are a couple different stages throughout the hero's journey where if the hero rejects the psychological truth and embraces their their psychological flaw the flaw that is holding them back from reaching their fullest potential then what will happen is they will become a tragic hero they will fall into tragedy their psychological flaw will lead them down a tragic path and so the examples we're about to show are just that and um and 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 before we jump into those and we're going to go opposite he asked for real life examples and then movie examples we're going to go opposite i'm going to do movie examples and then we'll go into real life examples but here, what we have, and I'm sorry, I'm just pointing at this GIF. I, this, I, on the fly, as we're talking, I thought, oh, hey, this is actually a pretty good example. If you're talking about a non-tragic hero, the normal arc is an upward arc where the hero grows positively during the, the hero phase. And in that positive arc, the hero is in this case confronted with a negative father figure okay there are positive and negative ones in in star wars in this particular trilogy you have obi-wan who is the positive depiction of the father figure and you have vader who is the negative depiction of the father figure vader is also the shadow in the story the shadow archetype so Vader, as the negative father figure, offers Luke an opportunity to atone with him, to become at one with him, to become at one with the negative aspect of the story theme. Meaning that if Luke had accepted and said, yes, let's do that. Let's fucking roll, Vader. Let's, let's go and rule the galaxy as father and son then he would have went in a negative spiral into a downward arc still an arc but that's what you call a tragic arc when it goes into a negative decline because the hero has fully embraced their psychological flaw which just not only prevents them from reaching their full potential so instead of staying flat they just start the, the world their world as they know it is destroyed by the negative aspect luke doesn't do that luke says no i won't have anything to do with that he still has to go through apostasis which is the cutting off of his hand which is symbolic of the removal of the psychological flaw that he had been holding on to but because he didn't in become at one with the negative father figure he ultimately has a positive arc and this is also very interesting many people 
when they look at Return of the Jedi, they're like, this doesn't make any sense because Luke isn't the one who defeats Sidious and he was the one who was supposed to defeat the Emperor because he's the hero of the story. He is a hero in an epic story that started, you know, with his father, Anakin. Anakin is actually the main hero of the entire um, trilogy prequel set. And so, actually, Anakin is rightfully the one who is supposed to defeat Sidious. If you look at the prequels and the trilogies as a whole thing. Now, granted, back when this movie first came out, the prequels didn't exist. But there was enough references to know that Anakin had fallen to the dark side. That Anakin was a tragic hero. And so this is what we see is like Anakin Vader has a what's called redemptive arc. So the redemptive arc looks almost like a U. They're, they're going like this. They take the tragic arc. And then at some point they accept the positive truth. And then redeem themselves. And that's why it's important for Vader to actually be the one to defeat Sidious. Now, did Luke perform a heroic duty? Yes. He is the one who, who was able to ultimately and finally convince Vader that there was still good in him. That Anakin still existed. That all the things that Anakin and the Jedi fought for and believed in still were worth fighting for. And it took Anakin's son as a grown adult for him to realize that, internalize it, for it to finally hook him back to the good side. And so that's a very, that's a very powerful thing. And also... Um, you, so what you see is a, a tragic character become redeemed. And, and one last thing, because all this will come into play as I explain the other examples. The, the final piece to that is, and I've mentioned this before, is that this was a role reversal. Just like you can have a negative father figure and a positive father figure, the roles can be reversed with atonement with father, where maybe the hero is the one who's trying to convince the father figure to do this thing, to take on a plan, to take an action, whatever. The atonement comes or is denied when one or both of them either accept or reject the offer. Okay, so it's a two-way street. It's not just the father, whether they're positive or negative, can offer the hero some sort of plan or idea but it's that the hero can also offer the father figure whether positive or negative a plan or idea and one or both of them can reject it that's very important this is it's kind of advanced and it took me a long time to realize this but i've seen enough of these things play out to realize that it's a it's like think of it as it's not a point to point kind of thing it's like a three-dimensional sphere where you know it can be moved and rolled around and stuff so the benefit to a writer and a storyteller is that that gives you so many different dimensions and angles to look at when deriving that scene when cultivating that scene and then in real life it also it's more depictive of how real life would be, which is many of us have at least one father figure, whether they're our actual father or a grandparent or a, a foster father, an uncle or something like that. And that individual, um, aside from that individual, there may be others who also take on that role, teachers, professors, uh, et cetera, et cetera, mentors down the road. And so, there will be multiple times within your life where in real life you will have a moment to have an atonement with the father and that's you'll there will be some sort of proposition on either your end or their end 
and either one or both of you will accept or reject the offer. And some offers cannot be refused. For example, death, right? Obi-Wan dies in the first movie in uh, A New Hope. And Luke has no, like, he, he can't do anything but accept the death of his father figure. He had, there is no other choice. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Like there are some events that happen that are outside of both of their controls. So with that being said, now let's get into more of the, now that I've laid the groundwork, let's get more into some of the examples that I have here. And before I get into the Lord of the Rings example, let's, let's take a look at another Star Wars example since we're on it. As I said before, Anakin is actually the hero of the entire trilogy and prequels. And his father figure was Qui-Gon Jinn. But as we all know, Qui-Gon Jinn was killed by Darth Sidious. Or I'm sorry, um, Darth Maul. And so after that, he gets a brother figure, a bigger brother figure in Obi-Wan. Many people think, oh, well, wait, Obi-Wan takes on the father figure. No, Obi-Wan is more like a bigger brother. He's like a Han Solo to, to Anakin. And that's why... They never really uh, find that good groove in training the way that Qui-Gon was able to do with both of them. Because they're more like brothers rather than father and son. But here you have this boy who has never had a father, who just left his mother and just lost the closest thing he ever had to a father figure... And now here comes this very important man in, in the galactic politics who says, hey, we're going to keep a big eye on you, right? That is the beginning of the, the tragic arc for poor Anakin. And then throughout the series, we see Palpatine, who most of us already knew, but eventually you find out <laughs> is the bad guy, slowly using his parental influence to to um, influence Anakin in the negative aspect. So Palpatine would be considered a negative parental figure. Not because, like, and, and here's, here's where you have to understand the difference between negative and positive. Obi-Wan, in the original trilogy, older Obi-Wan, fights, chops people's arms off, is a trickster, all those things. Those could be considered negative attributes, depending on your morality level and things like that. Negative doesn't mean negative in the sense of morality. Negative is when you're looking at the thematic uh, structure of the story, what is the theme? If the theme is, uh, well, I don't want to go into that, but it, but if they are promoting the positive aspect of the theme, meaning that they're going to help the hero reach their full potential and grow, then they are a positive mentor. If they are promoting ideas like Palpatine that are going to make the hero embrace their fatal flaw and decline and not reach their full potential, then they are a negative uh, influence negative parental figure <sighs> we'll get to that we'll get to that we'll get to that okay so here I wish I had put these in order but uh, I started the video before so we're just gonna roll with it this is Anakin's after you know Palpatine meets him he's taking him under his wing we don't see too much interaction with them in Clone Wars except that Palpatine suggests that Anakin is the one who takes Queen Amidala to Naboo. But already we can see Palpatine is like working behind the scenes as a puppet master and trying to be more a part of Anakin's life and upbringing. And ultimately that, that pays because, hold on, let me see if I can find, yeah, this picture. Okay. So that's actually important because in the Attack of the Clones, Palpatine's the one that suggests Anakin go with Padme. 
Now, did he know that they were going to become lovers or all that? Who knows? Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But he, in this scene, he uses the relationship with Padme to manipulate Anakin in a negative way. Because in this is in Revenge of the Sith, he, Anakin has been confiding in Palpatine about all the, the, the bad things that he doesn't like about the Jedi Order. And about the fact that he is having a relationship with the Senator, with, um, with Padme. And in that sense, Anakin and Palpatine have this close father-son bond. And what happens is, in this moment, Anakin has been having these dreams that Padme is going to die. And he's already concerned about what happened with his mother. And how he kind of let some dark side, dark energy out when he went and killed all of the sand people that had that had, had his mother um, captured. Now he's having similar dreams with Padme about her dying. And he confides in Palpatine. And finally, after years of patience and waiting and and putting his tendrils into Anakin now Palpatine feels like it's the time to strike and he uses his father his fatherly influence to say listen I'm gonna let you in on a little secret I can help you save Padme from death but the only way you can do that is if you learn the ways of the Sith and Anakin's like wait what do you mean Ultimately, he, fig he finds out Palpatine allows him to know that, hey, I'm actually the Lord of the Sith. And this is a real turning point. This is not the parental, this is, to be clear, this scene is not the atonement with Father. But this scene is laying the groundwork for what later is the scene of atonement with Father. Palpatine says, hey, look, you know, if... If you let me live, I'll teach you how to save her. But you can't go with the dogmatic teachings of the Jedi. You have to learn outside of the box, is basically what he says. Anakin goes along with it, kind of against his better judgment. Let's see, what else do I have here? Oh, don't need that. Okay, all right. Let's see if I can tie this all in now. Okay, so now let's go back. Then... I'm sorry, I keep jumping around to all these. Here we go. This is the Atonement with Father scene. And this is actually done really well. A lot of people give the prequels some, some crap. And don't get me wrong, there are some terrible scenes in there. Like the love scenes between him and Padme are garbage. But, in a lot of ways, Lucas did a good job. Especially with Revenge of the Sith. And I would say, especially with this scene right here. You want to see a scene where you have a hero being tempted by a, a, a parental figure and then they go into a tragic fate? This is the scene. This is, a, and it's not only a perfect scene because you have the dynamic between Anakin and Darth Sidious, but you also have Mace Windu. And I would contend that Mace Windu is also a father figure candidate. Okay? He may not have been fully embraced by, by Anakin as a father figure. But at one point in time, particularly when Obi-Wan came back and told the council, like, hey, I promised Qui-Gon that I would train this kid. You, Even though we don't see it, like... In major detail we can we get glimpses of it in in both the end of the Phantom Menace in Attack of the Clones and even in the beginning of this movie where we see that both Yoda and Mace Windu have played a major role in guiding Obi-Wan into training Anakin so in that sense, they are these other types of father figures. Now, they haven't been as influential as Darth Sidious, but they, they, have, they do have a similar 
uh, level of of influence and power, just not to the degree that that uh, Sidious does, because Anakin preferred Sidious's methods and ways. And so this is great because now what we're seeing here, like if you were to symbolize this, you have hero looking at positive parental figure and negative parental figure. And this is symbolic of the conflict that is going on inside of Anakin, inside of his mind, inside of his heart, between what he should do is right and what he wants to do that will, that will make him things happen that he wants to happen and it's also important to note i believe it's in clone wars but it might it might have been yeah i think it was in clone wars but it, it may have been in this movie where anakin seeks advice from yoda and yoda tells anakin that he must let go of all that he loves because those things are what lead to fear and hate and anger and hatred and the dark side and unfortunately, Anakin doesn't heed that advice. He becomes emotionally entangled with, with Padme, and now he finds himself in this situation. And again, this is very symbolic. Here you have Anakin's, you know, part of him saying, no, you know, I could use all of my power in order to, to do what I want to do. Damned be the consequences. And then over here, you, you have the representation of, Anakin's good side saying you know you can't use your powers just for own your own personal gain you have to consider the larger aspect and how it affects other people and so there's this dynamic between the two of them Anakin ends up siding with Sidious and impulsively takes off Mace Windu's arm and then Sidious blows him out the window in a very famous scene. And this, this is the depiction of Anakin uh, siding with his darker side, his negative parental figure. And this is the moment where his story goes from being on the borderline of a flat character arc to a negative, tragic character arc. And for those of you that don't know, Mace Windu does return, at least in the comics, and I think in the Clone Wars anime. But here we see, even immediately after, we see even now, Anakin is conflicted, and he's saying, what have I done? Knowing that he killed Mace, someone who was maybe not as close to him as the Chancellor, but still someone who was a major major role in his life for the last decade or so and then this is the ultimate atonement with father okay we we went through all of that there was an apostasis we saw the hand get chopped off of the positive mentor let's go back to that image right here oh right here anakin chops mace's arm off that is symbolic, that apostasis, that, that removal is the removal of the good sensibility that he had when trying to balance out this conundrum in his mind. And, and Mace getting blown out the window, it's all symbolic of Anik is, is now throwing out all the good and going full-blown dark side. And... That removal is, and even, this is another crazy thing, like Mace's, if you want to go deep, Mace's uh, sword, and I'm not saying that it was intentional, but it, it does fit the symbology. Mace's sword is purple. And if you look at purple, purple is like blue and red mixed together. Blue and red, blue is symbolic usually of a good Jedi, red is symbolic of a bad Jedi. Mace has always been kind of like the Jedi who's not gray, but like on the line, right? And that's the cool thing about Mace, but it, he also represents something in Anakin, that, that, that very fine balance between the dark and the light. And by removing that, 
Anakin goes full blown, full blown bad guy. Here, Sidious renames Anakin Darth Vader. I mean, th I mean, when you're talking about a scene that represents a tragic arc from a parental figure and the atonement, with, this is it. This is the scene. And so now you have. Um, now, now you see Anakin is fully accepting his new role as the bad guy of the universe, essentially. And he's fully accepting the negative parental figure's thematic argument. And they're joining as one. And now that they're joining as one, we have to see how does, how does Anakin take on that new thing. So the thematic argument, because it's negative, instead of Anakin reaching his higher fuller potential he's going to then decline into a negative lower potential and how do we see that what a crazy scene this scene right here he goes into the younglings and he takes them out what does that kid say is everything okay master skywalker and then he lights up his lightsaber that was nuts and it's a powerful scene and a lot of people were affected by it there was a lot of outrage actually about the scene, which, you know, in some ways rightfully so, but what people fail to realize in the, in the um, people who don't analyze the mythology aspect of, the, of the, the stories is that this scene is depicting a tragic arc of a hero. And for every society, for every culture throughout history, tragedies have been very important to show humankind what not to do and here Anakin serves as the example of what not to do this is a what not to do moment this is Anakin fully embracing his dark side his moment of apotheosis where he should be reaching his higher it's a moment where he should be reaching his higher potential he is falling from grace in reaching his lowest potential and so that's that's what we have here so I bring that up first because it tied in well with the the other example from with Luke to show contrasting things of a of a positive heroic arc versus a negative tragic arc for a hero and now we can and, and where where it really happens at the atonement with father stage it can happen at other stages but that's that that's what we're focused on is the atonement with father stage now let's go to another example that you guys saw earlier and actually that's not the one i want this is the one i want let me let me close out of the uh actually that's good okay now some of you may be familiar with this photo some of you may not some of you may not know who this is but there's this little story that a guy named William wrote called Romeo and Juliet. You may have heard of it. It's been kind of, you know, a couple people have been talking about it for the last few hundred years. But this is one of the greatest tragedies in literature. But the funny thing is, and I mean it, I mean it kind of tongue in cheek, it's not really funny, but because it's also a great love story, most people only remember it for the love story. Like I remember as a teenager watching this and like you almost forget about the ending because you think about the love story between Romeo and Juliet. And a lot of times that's the only piece that people focus on is like, oh, they had such a great love. They were willing to die for each other. But what people forget is that this is a tragedy. This is another example of what not to do. And if you look at the hero, Romeo, let's take a look at him real quick. Here's Romeo right here on the bottom, young Leonardo DiCaprio. Romeo is this lovesick teenager who is very impatient and rash and look, doesn't look before he leaps. I mean, that's Romeo. Okay, and while it's attractive to young teenage girls and most young teenage boys can relate with this, it's an example of what not to do. <laughs> I mean, 
Shakespeare was brilliant in creating a character that had all of the flaws, the fatal flaws that the, that like would be attractive and appealing to an audience. But that's who Romeo is. And the other key component here is like they come from two great houses that are in conflict with each other. So like you could look at like there's a whole political lens you could look at it through as well. We're not going to do that in this session, but um, Shakespeare always wrote uh, on several different layers. And for example, many of the plays that he wrote were, were made specifically for the royalty of that time. And the royalty were basically the ones that were doing all the politics. So that's besides the point, but it kind of does play into this a little bit, okay? Because for those of you that aren't familiar with the story, I don't know how you're not, but some people you know, haven't gotten to that level and some people just didn't care. But if you're here at this video, you care now. So let me explain. Romeo is part of one family. There's the, the, the Montagues and the Capulets and they hate each other. In this particular video, uh, sorry, movie, they're depicted as like two different business bosses, almost like mafiosos type guys. Um, and you know, in the old days, they were like two factioning knight families or whatever. You could look at it from like a political lens, but the point is they're from two families that don't fucking like each other and don't get along and will, will like probably never get along. And the whole theme of this story is actually broken out in the very first scene where you have the king, I'm sorry, it's the prince um, talking to, it, first it goes, cuts to the news, and then it's the prince, but it's basically, the idea is, because your families couldn't put aside your differences, your two children died. That's the ultimate theme here. And then we get to see how the two children died. And it's, it, there is a love story there, but it also speaks to, because if you look at Juliet, Juliet is very much like Romeo. She's like, she, at first she's a little bit hesitant about, you know, getting involved with him, but he's way more appealing to her than the clean cut humdrum dude that her mom is trying to set her up with. She comes from a well-off family and her mom is trying to set her up with like another rich guy that's charming and handsome and that she would have married, whereas Juliet wants the bad boy, which is Romeo. But what she doesn't realize is that Romeo, while a bad boy and, and definitely fun to hang around, has like, like he's not the best uh, decision maker of all times. We'll say that. So... What does this have to do with the father figure and all this business? To cut to the chase, Romeo and Juliet meet. Romeo has just been in a breakup. Like, it, I don't even think it's 48 hours old. Maybe not even 24 hours old since he broke up with, um, oh, I forget her name, Cordelia or, no, no, that's a different character. Um, anyways, anyways, he just broke up with his ex-girlfriend He's waxing and waning about her, and he's all upset about her. And then his best friend, um, God, what's his name? Oh, man, it's been a while since I looked at this. Anyways, his best friend invites him to a party. He goes to the party, he meets Juliet, and all of a sudden he's in love again. He's deeply, madly in love. And it's like... Within less than 24 hours, he's went from heartbroken from the last girl to deeply and madly in love. And then at the end of the party, they find out that they're both part of opposing families. He is the son and she is the daughter of the main two mob bosses. Okay? So now it sets into motion all of these these you know, terrible things. Her cousin comes after Romeo for crashing the party. Romeo ends up killing him. Like, there's there's a lot of bullshit that happens. But Romeo and Juliet still decide, like, they're in love and they want to take it to the next level. So again, in less than a week, maybe even less than, like, two or three days, Romeo goes to the local priest. I think he's a friar, actually. And he says, hey, I am in love I want you 
to marry me to this girl. And at first, the friar's like, whoa, 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 Romeo. He's like, you got to slow down. He actually has this really great line. I wish I, I don't know if I remember it exactly, but it's like, um, it's like, um, you know, hasty are the steps that trip and fall, or I don't know, something like that. I have to look it up, but it's a really clever line. But at first, he's like, Romeo, you don't need to be marrying some girl that you just met. But then Romeo tells him that it's the daughter of his sworn enemy, and I think she's Capulets, right? I think so. I think he's Montague and she's Capulets. And then all of a sudden, the friar changes his mind. Because the friar's thinking in his head, you know, as, a, and again, like he's symbolic of the church as well. He's like, he wants to be the peacekeeper. And how cool would it be if the two young ones got married and then that forced the families to stop fighting amongst each other? That forced the mob bosses to stop fighting amongst each other? And so he thinks while it's an ill-advised decision it might actually do some good like the greater good so he comes from i would say uh, mostly positive but also flawed uh parental mindset as the father figure because romeo has a terrible relationship with his father so does juliet they are the extreme negatives if if you ask me the the friar here He's more of a neutral father figure. He like he means well, but he's going about it in the wrong way. And so because of that, he doesn't quite fulfill the role of a positive father figure. And what happens? So he tells he he gets he weds them and and then the parents find out and they're all pissed off about it. Long st not only that, but then it's found out that Romeo killed Juliet's cousin. And so rather than being put to death himself, he's banished. And that's where he is out here. This is like he's kicked out of the, the big city where he lived, and now he has to live in the desert. Okay, all alone. So now he's banished, and... You know, as a love-drunk teenager who's rash, brash, impatient, he's only there for a couple days and he's going nuts. So then what happens is Juliet, sorry, I didn't get a picture of Juliet. Actually, this might be Juliet right here. She goes to the friar and says, hey, what if we did this thing where I could fake my death, because that was a big thing back in plays like a long time ago, fake my death, and then I will go be with Romeo. And for some reason, again, the friar, he means well, but he, he's like going along with these terrible ideas of teenagers, which is, he's like, oh yeah, you know, if we fake your death, your parents will be so upset at, at the loss that they'll, they'll reconsider their ways. And then when they find out that you're actually not dead, they'll let Romeo come back. Like, this is the flawed mindset that they all have. So, he gives her this medicine that basically allows her to stop her heart for a little while and make it seem like she's dead. In the meantime, he tells... He, ha he sends a messenger to send this... Right here, you can kind of see it says, Urgent Letter, to send this letter to Romeo to let him know, since he's out in the middle of the desert and, and doesn't get all the, all, like, all the word that she's actually not dead, that there's this whole plan that they're hatching and that soon they'll be together and that everything's going to be well. Well, the problem is when, when they find her dead, his cousin right here, and I, uh, Maybe it's not his exact cousin. It might just be one of his his um, father's lackeys. He finds he hears that Juliet is dead, and he drives to Romeo, and he tells him. That's why Romeo looks so distressed here. And so then Romeo grabs his gun and then heads out, not seeing the letter. And again, this is this is the problem. And also something I think I failed to tell you is like, 
when Romeo was banished, he went to the priest and the priest said, look, just lay low, hang out. I'll figure out a way to get you guys together. Don't do anything rash. Just wait for word for me. That's the main thing he tells him. Wait for word. And the key here is like, on a, like one of the thematic themes here is like, Romeo is too impatient. Romeo is, rather than like being thoughtful and calculating, he's just like jumps every time. And he's so, he's so um, impatient. So the, the parental figure literally tells him, just wait. Well, he doesn't wait. And this is where his tragedy begins, right here. This is where we see uh, Romeo at the at the atonement with father. Not he's rejecting the thematic argument of being patient, and instead he is yet again being brash. Jumps into a car and races back to the city that he's been banished to. At the at the at the uh, news of his lover's death, <coughs> and I didn't get any other pictures. I probably should have. But ultimately, what happens is Romeo finds Juliet. She seemingly dead. He drinks real poison and kills himself. And then she wakes up right as he's dying, realizes that he killed himself, and then she kills herself. And it's super, and then the whole families are like, how could this have happened? And it's like, part of it is because you guys have this enmity between each other. But then the other part of it is that the teenagers themselves were acting too irrational rather than like being patient. And that's the whole point. Like the, the truth is young love and, and lust and all these things is rash and impatient and that's the appeal of it but this is the like you know kind of hyperbolic version of danger so this would be another example of a tragedy and the reason why i like this one is one it's not it's not it's a modern depiction but of a very old story so it's not like this came from avengers or anything like that like this is a this is a older story it's also what I would call indirect. In the other one here, we see them physically together at the moment of it happening. Whereas here, this is an indirect version where, you know, it happened over a couple different scenes where there were conversations. And the thread is that the priest wrote this and inside of this is the thematic lesson that the hero is supposed to learn and in rather than being patient and listening to what he said he runs off without ever finding out the truth that he needed to know and so <clears throat> it's a very again another very well done example of the uh atonement with father where it leads to tragedy and in this one i would say we have a neutral parental figure Maybe you could make a, a, a note for it being positive because the one thing that the priest does do well is he's constantly telling Romeo to slow down, chill out, take your time, think about things. But Romeo won't do that. And in that regard, Romeo rejects the positive thematic message and instead does his own thing, which brings him into a negative arc that leads to tragedy. Lastly, let's go to The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, and um, let's see, I'm gonna exit out of that, exit out of that, just want to make sure that I didn't have any other photos for, uh, there's Romeo and Juliet, I guess I didn't. So I just have these two. So for those of you that have watched The Hobbit, you'll know you know what this is. This comes in the third film. 
And many people don't realize that Thorin is actually a lot like Darth Vader. His tragic arc and redemptive arc happen very quickly compared to Vader. Vader's is like over a series of six movies, whereas his tragedy and his redemption both happen in the same movie in roughly about 30 minutes or so time. And so, um, you know, they're different depictions of a similar tragedy redemption arc. And, um, and sometimes people don't realize that Thorin is a tragic hero and also a redemptive hero. Now, we're not going to really go into his redemption as much as his tragedy. And the thing about Thorin, just to kind of, for those of you who aren't familiar with the story, the, the best example, the, the, like the, the quickest thing I can say is, in the beginning of The Hobbit, before we ever even meet Bilbo, we learn that Smaug, the dragon, attacked the dwarves' mountain called the Lonely Mountain, where they had all kinds of treasures. But among the treasures... The most prized possession among the dwarves was called this was this thing called the Arkenstone. Now, mythologically speaking, story structure-wise speaking, this is the reward. This is the boon. This is the thing that everybody's trying to get. I mean, liter they literally have to face a dragon. You don't get more you don't get more mythological than that in storytelling in order to get the boon. So um, what happens, though, is slowly Bilbo realizes that this whole idea of the Arkenstone is consuming Thorin. And in the beginning of the film, one of the things that they do a very good job of mentioning is that the Arkenstone had driven his grandfather, I don't think it's uh, a th Thror, had driven Thror mad with greed and power, basically. And so the idea, this is something I mentioned in the pre in this video, uh, this one right here, is that often atonement with father and all that stuff has to do with going after your father's legacy, your family's legacy, their sword, their job, your father went disappearing. I mean, even here you see Thor and Odin, right? It's the kingliness, right? That one is supposed to inherit the throne and all this stuff. Well, it's the same thing in The Hobbit where you have an ancestor who was driven mad by basically power and greed. And then the dragon is symbolic of like, uh, they even mention this other thing called dragon's disease where it's like, you, you get consumed by, by the greed of that which what you want. And because of that, this, the dragon is symbolic of like this nastiness inside of each of us that we have, which cannot be satisfied ever. And you'll notice many dragons in mythology, negative dragons, um, they're they're lustful they, they always have like a harem of virgins with them they always have treasures with them all these things that the dragon cannot fucking use because they're a dragon yet they want them because as a symbol of their power they want to possess the things even those in which they cannot even use that's the ultimate expression of greed and the corruption of power and so dragons have always been symbolic of that they're they're not the only creature but they're one of them and um the point is right thorin takes back his homeland that's the heroic deed that he does but he falls into tragedy when he becomes yet again consumed with finding the arkenstone rather than helping his people out Rather than being um, being a peaceful person, rather than giving the share, like here, this, this whole meme that we're looking at right now, where Bard is like, will you have peace or will you have war? And he says war. He would rather have war to prove, a, to, because of his pride, 
than to just give the people some of the treasure inside of the Lonely Mountain, despite the fact that there's plenty of treasure for everybody, basically, right? And so it drove him mad just the same way it drove his great-grandfather Thror mad. The, so this becomes another indirect, meaning that Thror isn't there. Well, I would say this is direct and indirect. And let me, let me explain why. Thror, Thror his great-grandfather, isn't there. But he's dealing with the same issues that Thror did. And he's succumbing to them. And this is also another theme that we see not only in Lord of the Rings, but in other fantasy where like mankind has these flaws that are that are given through bloodlines, right? And so men have this difficulty overcoming their greed, which is also true in real life. Now, where it is direct is you have a father figure in Gandalf. Now, Gandalf is a father figure to everybody, especially Bilbo, who is the secondary hero. Now, and, and when I say secondary hero, I mean that only in the sense of this video that we're making right now. Because what you really have in The Hobbit is two different heroes. You have the kingly hero, which is Thorin. And Thorin becomes not only he's he's the kingly hero archetype, he also becomes a tragic hero and a redemptive hero. Whereas Bilbo is the everyman hero, and he becomes the positive hero or, uh, re arc. There is no redemption. He just reaches his full potential. And so in, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like Vader and Luke, where... Vader has this negative arc, but then redeems himself, and Luke continuously has a positive arc. So, what happens? This is the moment of parental atonement where the parent figure confronts Thorin with the other hero, with the with the everyman hero, Bilbo, and the you know the armies and stuff. And he says, listen give the Ark, like, we'll make the trade, we'll give you the Arkenstone, give them the treasure that they deserve, give them, what you know, their fair share. And <clears throat> as we all know, he says, I would rather have war. And so that's him, again, rejecting the thematic lesson, which is to, in both Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, the thematic lesson is that um, power corrupts and ultimate power corrupts completely. And so therefore, the more power that Thorin gets, the more corrupted he becomes. The more corrupted by the treasures that he has and the power that he has. Just like the dragon, things that he doesn't even need or couldn't ever use in a lifetime, he still wants control over them, no matter the cost. No matter if other people have to die. No matter if his own people have to go. You see? And so... That is him rejecting the positive mentor, uh, sorry, parental figure, and um, then going down into a negative arc. And then ultimately he redeems himself by sacrificing himself in order to kill Azog, the, the shadow figure in the story, and, and like this representation of evil, and, and the representation of uber corruption of power so hopefully those of you who have bared with me this long I mean, this is a long video but the other one was a long video and for him to even for the question that was asked to even have been asked you would have had to have gotten all the way through to about the 30 minute mark to even like known to ask that question so for those of you that have stuck with me thanks for sticking around uh, i know it's been a long one now, let's talk very quickly and lastly about um, what are situations that could lead someone to be a tragic hero. We use the movie examples because I think now you have context or an understanding of how it works in a fictional setting. So then you just say, how does that apply to a real life setting? And something that we brought up in this video, Susie and I, she's, she's at work right now, um, is that... 
the I had to check what time it is. <laughs> okay. Um, s something that she brought up is like sometimes the parental figure can be a negative parental figure. And and the examples we were giving because she works in facilities where people are you know um, struggling with drug overdoses and alcoholism and other addictions. Um, sometimes the father figure that the person sees as a father figure could be an uncle could be a could be uh their literal father could be you know an older person that they that they just look to as that that guide um could be giving bad <laughs> advice if you know and if it were a story it would be the negative theme right and so maybe that's a father who was a drunk themselves and um, showed the all the wrong ways to uh, live a family life or maybe it's the um, you know the older friend who's like hey let's go out for drinks even though they know that you have a drinking addiction and I mean it doesn't have to be drugs or alcohol it could be something as simple as like um, we always use the food example. Uh, the, uh, you know, maybe you have an eating issue, and the the person is offering you, um, you know, hey, let's go out. Oh, oh, I know. Actually, this is one. This is one that uh, is near and dear to my heart. Maybe you know someone that has diabetes. And or sorry, well, like in this situation, you would be the one with diabetes. And the, uh, the person is like, hey, let's go have some cake or something like that. When you accept that quote unquote thematic premise of let's go have a cake and you're the one with diabetes, you're going down, you're embracing your tragic flaw and you're going down a tragic path, which is going to lead you away from your full potential and to destruction. Um... And, you know, you could look at it in, in terms of relationships and affairs, and you could look at it in terms of, you could, you could look at it at the other way too. This is actually a really good example. Let's say you're someone who likes to work out. And let's say that you go to a gym where there's this person who you look up to as kind of like a father figure. They're, they're a little older, or maybe they're a lot older, and they're in really good shape. And you're like, I want to be like that when I'm older. And their recommendation to you is you have to work out every day three hours a day you have to run you have to do this you have to limit your food and all and it's like an insane regimen that for whatever reason they're able to follow and you think that because they're older and wiser that you should follow it and all it does is like ruin your body that that is a good example of a real life where someone who is a father figure could lead you down a tragic path. The flip side is also true. Maybe they're like, let's use the same example. You're someone that needs to do a, like a little bit of working out. You're kind of out of shape and you go to this father figure and they're like, listen, <clears throat> you don't have to work out every day. You don't have to kill yourself. Just try to show up one day a week every day and do some sort of resistance training. And you're like, you know what? That makes sense. But then you go back home and you sit on the couch and you don't do anything. That would be the example of someone in real life receiving a positive thematic message and rejecting it from their father figure and going down a tragic path. And so hopefully these make sense. Um, if not, as usual, please leave a comment just like this individual did excuse me and um and if it's something that seems like it will edify the other listeners subscribers and and whatnot then we'll make a video like we did today and if it's something that's a little bit more unique or personalized then i'll at least type a response but um i don't know how long this video has been let's see 
it's got to have been at least 30 minutes, maybe even more. But um, hopefully this has been helpful. If it has, please go ahead and click the like button. Go ahead and share with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, keep reaching for your fullest potential. This has been Josh Coker, a.k.a. Josh Miss Prime. Good to see you. Expect more in the future. Take it easy.